So this is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, Minister do, you do you now regret, regret when, when once asked what your favourite joke was, was, you replied Nick Clegg. And, and Deputy, Deputy Prime, Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr. Trump, why should you be president? What, what makes, makes you fit for the role? Is it is just, just one big ego, ego trip? trip? Thank you. Thank you. Thank People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You exactly. say things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. In this podcast series, How Did We Get Here? I try to provide context and background to a big story in the news. This week, we know the pandemic's damaging our economy, but is it also fundamentally changing it? Is government going to emerge from this crisis playing a bigger role? Will we pay more but different taxes? Could this crisis shove us towards a much greener economy? I've been talking to Miata van Wuller, Chief Executive of the centre-left think tank, the New Economics Foundation. She's an economist by trade who worked in government under Blair, Brown and Cameron. I began by asking her, we know the economic damage is going to be bad, but just how bad? It's looking pretty grim. So the estimates that we've got from the Office of Budget Responsibility, that's the government finance and economic watchdog, um, as well as the Bank of England, are suggesting that we are facing one of the deepest recessions in 300 years. Uh, so huge contraction uh, in the economy. Uh, we know that one of the impacts of this will be on unemployment. So we are set to see levels of unemployment we haven't seen in 25 years. Um, you know, the prediction of the Office of Budget Responsibility is a 2.1 uh, million increase in unemployment, um, but it's possible that it could be much higher than that. Um, so I don't think you can underestimate just how tough it's going to be. Um, I think the big question is whether we recover quickly. So there's a bounce back. So it's grim for a time, but then we go back to um, some sort of normal quite quickly, uh, what people call the V-shape, or whether this is um, a protracted, uh, slow, slow recovery, which will be very, very painful to get out of. I mean, people can remember coming out of the, the big financial crisis, 2008-9, is this just worse and deeper or is it a different source of financial crisis? So it's both worse and different. Um, so it's worse in so far as um, the, the scale of contraction blows the financial crisis out of um, the water. So, you know, we have essentially stopped economies both here and in other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, the impact on this is far, far more profound um, and far more shocking. It's also very different in nature because if you like, the financial crisis, particularly in this uh, country, was a crisis that essentially beset the financial sector and didn't really um, impact on the real economy until much later. Um, it impacted on the real economy as a consequence of government policy like austerity. It impacted on the real um, economy as things like you know wages struggled uh, to fully recover. Whereas this crisis goes straight to the real economy. You know, we have shut down sectors. Uh, the impact on people, their lives, their livelihoods, their jobs is real, it's visceral, it's immediate. Um, so it is different in that nature, as well as tragically being far, far worse. Now, we've had recently, you know, some eminent economists, like the chief economist of the Bank of England, talking about the V-shape, which you mentioned already, going down fast, bouncing out fast. Is that based on the idea that this is a, a very different crisis to, to what happened in 2008, that there's basically money, demand, etc. sitting there. We've just artificially stopped it. So if we can unstop it, then it could come bouncing back. Absolutely. So the idea of a V shape is that, look, we've basically just put the economy on freeze. And as soon as we defrost it, everything bounces back to normal. I'm a little bit sceptical about that. And the reason I'm sceptical about that is that we know that the virus isn't going to go away anytime soon. You know, our best hope is a vaccine. But even then, it's not clear that the vaccine will uh, ensure that we have immunity forever. So there are lots of unknowns, which means that we should expect that for some time, we're going to have to have some measures of social distancing. We should expect that for some time we'll be going in and out of either localised or more um, widespread lockdowns. That's hugely disruptive to the economy. Um, and people who will be rightly nervous about the impacts of that will shift their behaviours. So, you know, you might see some recovering in demand, 
that people are not going to flock into pubs and shops and restaurants uh, in their droves in the way that they were before. So I think that, you know, it's likely that the impact is going to be sustained for much longer than, say, the Bank of England um, are predicting. You know, their projections was about, you know, we bounce back in a year. Um, I can't see that happening. And then if the numbers of unemployed are as big as we think they're going to be, that also has an impact on demand and that has an impact on the economy. OK, well, we'll, we'll come back to some of those issues. But I just want to also, with one more reference back to what happened before uh, in the financial crisis after 2008, in terms of governments managing it, uh, managing it back then, David Cameron, George Osborne, took the view that you had to reduce public spending hard, what was come to be called austerity. I don't get the impression, and certainly the Prime Minister is pretty you know, um, explicit about this, there's no appetite to do that this time round in terms of managing the, the, this crisis, is there? No, which is uh, you know one of the silver linings, because my view is the austerity back then was a really flawed policy. And it was a flawed policy because, you know, you cut... Uh, and you cut essential services, you know, so you take social care, you take health, you cut them to the, you know, you, you cut them to the bone, or at least you cut them to a level below where the requirements and demands of them would justify. And then you have these moments of crisis like a pandemic, and you then have to chuck loads of money to kind of rectify the cuts that you've made. So because Yes, it does the job of stripping down spending, but there are costs associated with that. You know, you denude your social infrastructure. It has a negative impact on the economy. Um, and so it felt then, and it certainly feels now looking back, like it was the wrong policy. So I think I'm really encouraged by the fact that the government isn't talking about austerity, that they recognise that the thing that you have to do in this sort of a crisis is invest and spend your way out of it. That feels counterintuitive to people. But if you think about the financial crisis, the US, for example, made the decision that the way that they were going to get themselves out of the crisis was a big fiscal stimulus. So you spend to just get the economy working again to boost uh, demand. And then what that does is that increases revenue. And if you increase tax receipts and revenue, you're able to pay down your deficit. And um, it was a different strategy. We did a hybrid, but we went a bit too heavy, in my view, on the spending side. I mean, the... You say invest and spend, you know, the money's got to come from somewhere, you run up a deficit, you run up more borrowing. You can't just do that you know, into the into the longer term, can you? We're already heading for, you know, some of the predictions about 100% of uh, GDP equivalent of debt. You just can't just borrow your way out of this, though, can you? Not forever, no, but you can in the short term. And the reason why you can in the short term is, you know, what matters is less the size of the deficit, but your ability to finance it, how sustainable it is. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of irony is that our deficit is at historical highs. Of course it is um, because of the scale of intervention the government had to make. But our cost of financing it um, is at historical lows. It has never been, you know, um, the, the, the cost of financing it as a proportion of government revenue is about 4%. That's the lowest it's been uh, on record. Um, and in the end, that's what matters. Um, and, you know, businesses make the same judgment as well. They constantly borrow from the markets to invest. And as long as it's sustainable, as long as your cost of repaying that is sustainable, you're okay. You can't do it forever, but you can certainly do it um, in the short term in order to get you back to where you are. And then once the economy starts working properly, then a combination of receipts and I think taxation, you know, we're gonna have to have an honest conversation about taxation coming out of this, because if you want all the upsides so of, you know, good public services, the kind of resilience we want in the economy, people looked after at points of crisis, you've got to collectively be willing uh, to pay for that. What you talk about the short term, what is the short term? One year? So, I mean, my view is that uh, we've got a really rocky one year ahead of us, um, but I think the recovery is going to probably take longer. Um, and for me, it's not enough for us just to recover back to, you know, the way the economy was before the crisis, because, uh, you know, let's be very clear, the economy was in crisis itself. We were sort of limping around, uh, you know, stagnation, zero uh, percent uh, growth. Uh, we had the most remarkable thing whereby literally for 10 years, living standards had not shifted. Uh, we've never had that before in our history, that we saw growth, yes, at points, uh, but it wasn't translating into people benefiting from it. 
uh, we saw wage stagnation, and we have a climate crisis. So, you know, all of those underlyings haven't, underlying factors haven't gone away, um, and they are going to coincide with this pandemic in a way that means that I think in the for the next, you know, five years, it's going to be tough because we're going to have to address and have a reckoning with all of those things. Um, but then there is the opportunity that actually if we do the right things now, we come out of that and we come out of that in a better way with a stronger economy, but one that is fairer and one that is greener. And that must be the ambition that we build back, but we build back better. Right. I promise I will ask you about exactly how we do that. I've got one sort of slight sidebar question, again, for the non-experts amongst us. We talk about borrowing money in government. Who is lending us this money? Who's got the money to lend us? Who's got the money to lend it to us? And, and, uh, and why should they? We borrow from the capital market, so the government issues bonds um, and people buy those bonds. Um, and the Bank of England uh, will also, uh, can also, and will also underwrite government debt um, at points. Um, and they will, they will lend to us because actually the safest place to lend to are governments and states because, you know, unless things are really bad, and yes, there are states that have gone bankrupt, but broadly, uh, you know, the state will always exist. So if you're looking, if you know, if, if it's a choppy time, if it's a difficult economic time, a safe bet is to put your money into government bonds because you know that they're unlikely to uh, renege on paying you back um, and there is always a steady yield. Um, and actually at points where interest rates are, you know, historically low, there's not that much money if you're an investor, there are not that many options to think about where you make money. So actually government bonds are quite a good option. Um, and that's why we're constantly able to uh, borrow from the market. But if it looks as if you haven't got your debt under control or you don't have a plan to get it under control over the longer term, people will start charging you, you know, more money to, you know, to, to, to lend you money. They'll start putting their interest rates up or they might you know, not want to lend you any money anymore. Yeah, so I mean, and that comes back to our credit rating. Um, if your credit rating plummets, and we're nowhere near our credit, credit rating uh, plummeting, but if it does, uh, then um, the sort of international financial market sees you as a risky bet. So both the appetite to buy bonds, um, but also the kind of premium that's attached to that goes up. Um, but I come back to the fact that yes, we are taking on quite a lot, uh, of debt, uh, so is every other country in the world in order to kind of weather this storm. So if you like, uh, we're all in collective good company or bad company, however you want to see it. But the key thing is the cost of financing it. And interest rates are at historical lows. So if you're ever going to borrow to get yourself out of a hole, if you're ever going to borrow to try and reconfigure and make your economy better, this is the time to do it. OK, so as we keep hearing, this is a crisis. But it's an opportunity. That's that's the kind of uh, a, a slogan you hear a lot. From your point of view, what would you like to see a government doing, using this as an opportunity to build back a better economy? What what was sort of encouraging is that you know the prime minister uh, gave his speech um, this week, and he went very big on his pledge to build back better, which, you know, we loved hearing. Uh, that, that's our slogan. Brilliant. Um, he was I'm sure he got it from you. <laughs> very big on his ambition for a new deal, which is exactly what we think uh, is needed, something at the scale of what uh, Roosevelt did in the US in response to the Great Depression feels like the scale of response that we need. Um, I think what was a little bit uh, more disappointing uh, to understate things was just what was offered, uh, which was you know five billion pounds, which sounds like a lot and is important, but unfortunately was, if you like, commitments that had already been made and were being reheated. And at 0.2% of GDP is a tiny stimulus. So to give you a point of comparison, um, after the financial crisis, the sort of stimulus we saw from the government was about 1.5% of GDP a year. Um, uh, for the New Deal, it was about 5% a year, amounting to about 40% in total. So we are thinking about completely different order of magnitudes. But at least they're there in rhetoric. Uh, so, you know, there's some way to go, but we're part of the way there. Uh, for me, the key components of a recovery plan has to be a plan that not just responds to the pandemic, but recognizes 
all the issues that the pandemic has exposed that have been long-standing issues. So, you know, the levels of inequality in a society, the fact that our social safety nets and infrastructure have been denuded, uh, the fact that we've got a climate emergency that we're not tackling, it's got to deal with all of that. So, you know, we want a plan that firstly protects public services that people rely on, particularly uh, social security, social care, health and housing. Um, a plan that looks to tackle inequality between people and places in a meaningful way. Uh, one that looks to create good jobs, not just any old low pay rubbish jobs, but good jobs, particularly against the backdrop of unemployment. And then finally, one that prepares in a way that we did not prepare for this pandemic for the bigger crisis, which is already upon us, of climate change. And I stress that latter piece because we've now seen how a natural crisis can blow everything out of the water and fundamentally change all aspects of our lives. That is what climate change will do and more. And so we've got to learn the lesson and we've got to start preparing for it. OK, my immediate thought on hearing you run through that list of the things that you think we need to do is that would sound to me like you've just added a lot more money and time onto the recovery because it might be easier just to sort of do a quick and dirty return to where we were. Uh, it, it would definitely in the short term be easier to do a quick and dirty return. Um, but then what's the point of that? And I say that because, you know, the lesson that we took from 2008, where we recovered the economy, uh, but, but, you know, living standards in 2020 were no higher than they were in 2008. What is the point of an economy where people do know better? You know, it has always been the thing that we get our economy to work because it works for people. And if it doesn't, there is something fundamentally broken about that. On the piece around public services, we have seen that if we don't provide proper protections, it costs us in the long term. And if we don't respond to climate change, forget it. It will completely blow our economy out of the way. So yeah, we can return back to where we were in the short term, but the long term costs will be more profound and more painful. So if we are going to have to dig our way out of this, in a way that's already changing the way our economy works. Let's do it to try and get us to the place that we need to be. OK, in terms of practical decisions, then, if we wanted to follow your model, does that mean things like the aviation industry or car manufacture of, of, of petrol cars? You, know, you just say, sorry, that's done. There is no help for that sort of industry anymore, for instance. So what I think is uh, interesting, fascinating, it's seems odd to use those words about a crisis that's impacting on people's lives in this way. But if you think, um, if you take the aviation industry as an example, where aviation emissions have been going up, so in m many other sectors, emissions have been going down, Avi aviation it hasn't. And that was always a reckoning that was coming. And, you know, ironically, the pandemic has just massively thrown a wedge into that um, and seen a huge plummeting of aviation emissions because planes aren't able to fly. Uh, and for me, I'm like, well, why don't we try and lock in some of that? Uh, you know, we are going to have to have flying. I don't dispute that in the short term, but we're going to have to do a lot less of it. And given that we are having to travel less anyway, let's lock that in and actually think about ways in which we can help retrain um, and place people who are currently working in the aviation sector into some of the sectors of the future. So there is already a disruption that is some, in some ways doing some of the jobs that we need it to do for climate change, because that disruption was going to come anyway. Um, and it was whether you know we kind of dawdled along and then there was a crisis point and we just had to stop aviation because we were panicked because the impact of climate change was happening, um, it was going to come. Some of it is already happening. Why don't we use this moment to start pivoting us in the way that we need to get to? So what do you say to those people working for Airbus or EasyJet or whatever who are looking at losing their jobs? You just say, that's tough, but hopefully we'll train you for something else. That's, a, that's quite a hard one to swallow still for them, isn't it? Absolutely. So what we have proposed, and we put out um, a, a, a paper on uh, the aviation sector in particular and the bailout, uh, we think that the government should step in and should bail out the aviation sector. And we think there should be a kind of managed transition. Uh, so part of it will be uh, propping up and in the way that the furlough scheme has um, the wages of people in the aviation sector and then putting in a really aggressive program of retraining and replacing um, so that, you know, it's an awful outcome if you have lots of people falling through the cracks and uh, unemployment that's long-term and scarring. So there has to be an active intervention to go in, 
to try and retrain people and then to actively try and put them in jobs that are being created elsewhere. I mean, the government is all obviously already taking a massive intervention interventionary interventionist step into the UK economy in a, in a way that, you know, the sort of economic philosophy that we, we sort of grew up with 20 over the last sort of generation would not have expected. And it feels like there is something profound going on. Do you think this is something profound where the kind of whole relationship between the state and the economy is changing from what has been considered the sort of received wisdom that it's basically the state's job to get out of the way and let businesses get on with it? Yeah, I mean, it does feel like there is a rupture uh, with the old mainstream. Um, And it's interesting to note that actually historically, these ruptures with the kind of the dominant, what we call orthodoxy, but the dominant mainstream always happens at points of crisis. So, you know, coming out of the Great Depression, coming out of the Second World War, there were moments where the kind of dominant paradigm shifted. And it feels like we're in that moment at the moment, at 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 the present. And I think the thing that's, you know, quite interesting is how in response to the crisis the government is willing to throw to one side the ideology i think that was completely right um and also i think the thing that it's shown us is you know there is a role for the government it can act quickly it can act in the right ways in order to you know help support stimulate encourage the economy that feels absolutely right that's not to the detriment of saying you know there's no role for the private sector we want to squeeze out the private sector but governments can and should always play an enabling role and at some point over the last 40 years i think there are moments where we lost sight of that not all countries you know so if you think about the model in europe a lot of the social democratic um, economic model there always had a strong role for the state alongside the private sector. I'd argue that the UK and the US went a bit further in, you know, what we call neoliberalism. Uh, but but this idea that, you know, the market is supreme and the state should try and get away out of the way as much as possible. And I think that was always a flawed, you know, theory and orthodoxy. Um, and I think moments like this help you rebalance. And do you think Boris Johnson is a prime minister to be comfortable doing that? Well, I mean, who knows what Boris Johnson thinks? Uh, I think all sides of the spectrum are are baffled uh, and we can't quite place him. Um, What I think is that the Prime Minister isn't particularly ideological. Um, I think he cares about power. I think he cares about winning. Um, I hope that he also cares about trying to do some good in the country, but I don't know. Um, And so he will do whatever he has to Uh, in order to ensure that he has got a record that means that the election gains that they made in the last election they keep. And if that means being more interventionist, if that means being more uh, state investment, he'll do it. Um, I think you have prime ministers that are, if you like, clouded and and coated in ideology, um, and they're not willing to be that pragmatic. And I don't think that's the bent of him as a prime minister or his number 10. Um, I think the challenge is that they're going to try and keep everyone happy, um, you know, so, and that's okay if you're being pragmatic, but but I'm not sure it translates into a coherent programme. And the big test of the government is, great chat, <laughs> does it translate into a coherent programme? Oh, what does that programme mean? And what is it that you're trying to do for the country? Um, and the messages around that are all mixed at the moment. I mean, we talked a lot about how a government is going to borrow more to, to see us through this, and that... Would, I think I'm right in thinking that you think that's a, that's basically a good idea. But what about taxes? Are we going to have to put up taxes as well to get out of this? So I think in the medium term, so I think the gov- government will continue borrowing for some time. I think as we get out of the immediate uh, crisis, and actually it will be less about... Um, if you like, rescue measures and more about the social settlement that we want to put in place coming out of this. And if we say the social settlement is one where we say that, you know, we want to invest in public services, uh, that we want to invest in people and places to tackle inequality, then there will be a question about how do you pay for it in the round? And that's where I think you have to have a conversation about taxation. And for me, the conversation about taxation is threefold. First, let's be honest that, you know, let's have an honest debate that says, well, you know, we do want a really good national health service free at the point of use. Actually, we want that for social care as well. So we're going to have to pay for this stuff. And it makes sense for us to club together to do that uh, because it's more efficient than individuals having to bear the cost of it. The second bit of it is, okay, well, if we say we have to 
like raise taxes to do that how do we do that in the most progressive way and uh, there are two parts of that you know those that can bear most that have broader shoulders bear more of the burden of taxation that that's absolutely right but then there are parts of our system we don't tax particularly well we don't tax wealth at all uh, we tax it really badly um, and so i think we've got to rebalance between how we tax things like income versus how we tax things like wealth um, and that has to be part of the mix can I just jump in there? You're talking about wealth. I mean, for most people, that's their houses, maybe, or where they live. I mean, it's 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 been very difficult even just to redo the bans for the council tax over the last few years because uh, this is such a sensitive area. Do you think it's realistic to say, OK, we're going to actually have, a, have a, a wealth tax, which would largely be based on people's property? Well, it's in part people's uh, property, but it's also capital gains. Um, so if you think about, you know, tax ratio... The, the rate of taxation for the average person and then you think about how much we uh, tax for example capital gains there's a huge disparity so there's definitely space um, to rebalance you look politicians don't like talking about this because it's politically difficult but I, I that is why I think you do need to have a conversation that says uh, you know there is a role for the government to ensure that they use our money well and actually that's not always the case and that really winds people up <laughs> and makes you think well why am I paying all of this and it's been squandered so there's definitely part of that but but if you say this is the settlement that we have you know these are the things that we will do you know uh, I, I think you can have a debate with the public and we see in you know Scandinavian countries that do have high levels of taxation but it means you have you know free childcare. it means that you have world-class health care social care and if you say, well, this is, this is the package, this is what we are doing collectively, and yeah, that might mean you pay a little bit more, I think you can have that debate. But uh, politicians are very nervous um, about having that debate. And so there's always an attempt to, if you like, uh, brush over the fact that in the end, um, you know, we have to collectively pitch in together if we want certain things to be available to all of us. Now, now this government has ruled out in the, in the manifesto raising national insurance, VAT, income tax. I mean, have we, have we reached the limit, dare I say, anyway, of taxing income in the way that we have done, whether it's national insurance or, or income tax? And that's why maybe we have to look at alternative things to tax, where, where, which could be taxable. Yeah, I think we have. So I think that, you know, we can, you can play around with the taxation system uh, in order to get more out of it. Um, so you can play with the bands, you can, there are different ways in which you can restructure it. And also you could probably add a little bit more. Um, you know, we are still, um, you know, our, our sort of, if, if you compare our tax burden compared to other countries in Europe, they're not particularly high. So there is some space to move up, but not huge amounts, which means that you then need to think about other ways in which you tax. Um, and, and I go back to wealth because actually there is a huge chasm there. I, and things like, you know, people always go back to, for example, land value tax. There are huge windfalls that are generated. And at the moment, we don't take enough of a slug to help us do things collectively. Uh, so we need to think about that. Coming to the end there, really, I mean, do you really think this is a moment when the economy can be reset? Um, or is that uh, is that the sort of dream that people, dare I say, like yourself, have had? And the, the worry is, you know what, in the end, once you get through a crisis, you just go back to where you were. So the honest answer is I don't know. I think there is a genuine world in which we go back to how we were. But my sense is that a reckoning is on the way anyway. Uh, and whether that reckoning comes at this particular moment of crisis or comes further down the line, there will have to be a change because, you know, we cannot have what's in the wake in, in waiting around the corner through climate change. We can't have an economy that doesn't work for the majority of people. We can't have a world in which living standards are stagnant for 10 years. I mean, you know, we can't have the pockets of deprivation and poverty that we have and for there not to be a reckoning. And I think we were already starting to see that, you know, in some respects, the, the politics of Trump, uh, the backlash around Brexit, all of that was people saying, this is not working for us. This settlement is not working for us. And, you know, this crisis either creates a point of departure because it has exposed all of that so viscerally, or if it doesn't, we limp on for a bit longer and then there is another point of rupture. So uh, we can't get away from change because in the end, the model that we have, I think has 
lost its utility, I don't think is working for enough people. And at some point, the politics of that will catch up with the economics of that. Um, I think this moment of crisis is potentially it, but if it's not, it's coming around the corner very soon. Miata Fundwiller, thank you very much indeed for uh, talking to us uh, for this edition of How Did We Get Here and sharing your insights and uh, vision of perhaps how things could change, hopefully, once we're out of this crisis, if we can look back at some point on, uh, on what we're all going through at the moment. But thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Miata van Buller of the New Economics Foundation. There are moments when people dare to dream of doing things differently, and every now and then it might actually happen. If you thoughts on this or suggestions for another podcast, you can email me on andy.bell at itn.co.uk. I'm tweeting at, at andybell 5 news and you can find Miata and her team at, at NEF. Thanks for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another one along soon.